Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining today. I think we will go ahead and get started here and um, people will trickle in over the next few minutes, but um, it's great that we have so many people joining us to talk about nature-based solutions for coastal resilience, habitat enhancement, and water quality improvement at the San Francisco Bay shoreline. Um, so this webinar is hosted by the Bay Area One Water Network and the San Francisco Estuary Partnership. And as you may have heard, it's being recorded and we'll post it um, on the Bay Area One Water Network website afterwards. Uh, next slide, please, Liz. So just a few logistical, um, a little logistical guidance here. There should be a Q&A question at the bottom of your screen and use that to ask questions um, about the presentation. But if you have technical questions or issues with the Zoom, um, please email Diana. Next slide. So to start that we wanna acknowledge that the San Francisco Bay is the unceded ancestral homeland of many indigenous people, including the Himran Ohlone, Halkin, Salkan tribe, the villages of Lashan, the Karkin, Muwekma, Ramaytush, um, Tamin, Yokut Saloni, Coast and Bay Miwok, Patwin, and the Ama Mutsun tribal band. The broader San Francisco estuary is also the homeland of the Plains Miwok, Wapo, Wintun, and Nisanan people. We recognize that we benefit from living and working in their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of these tribal communities and by affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples of these nations. And my apologies if I've mispronounced any of the tribal names. I did look up different pronunciations, but sometimes there were multiple different pronunciations for the same name that I found online. So please email me and let me know separately if, if I mispronounced something. Okay, next slide, please. So today, um, here's a quick agenda. We're, we'll have a little introduction to the issues we'll be talking about, and then we'll go into um, some of the findings from our workshop and report. Um, we'll talk about the goals for nature-based solutions for shoreline resilience, and we'll talk about um, different challenges and solutions. We'll talk about key milestones um, in the near term and future research that's needed. And we'll end up with um, some lessons that we learned and then we'll open it up into Q&A where everybody can participate who wants to. Next slide. So uh, we all know that sea level rise is, is uh, really happening and will continue to happen. So in the San Francisco Bay estuary, we've measured about seven inches of sea level rise since 1900. And we expect at least another 40 inches by 2100. Next slide. And, and as we know, um, our neighborhoods, our wastewater treatment infrastructure, our transportation infrastructure, our marsh, marsh and wetland habitat are all at risk here. Next slide. So um, there are many different ways of addressing sea level rise. One of them is hardened seawalls, which may have a place in parts of the San Francisco Bay estuary, but there has also been research that has modeled that building hardened seawalls in some places in the estuary might cause increased flooding in, in other places. So there's also interest in nature-based solutions um, for addressing sea level rise in the Bay Area. And the International Union for the Conservation of Nature defines nature-based solutions as actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural or modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So some of those benefits could include habitat improvement, public access to open space, protection of infrastructure or habitat in the face of rising seas, access for traditional cultural uses, and water quality improvement. Um, thank you. So here in this workshop, we're talking, we, we framed our roundtable discussion and our report around three main benefits that we hope nature-based solutions in the Bay Area will achieve, and that's water quality improvement, shoreline resilience, and habitat enhancement. Next slide. So um, back in November of 2021, we, um, with the team that you see here, organized a roundtable discussion really focused on this issue of how can we advance nature-based solutions for shoreline resilience in the Bay Area? So we had a planning team that you see here. And next slide, Liz. 
We also had a workshop steering committee. I really want to thank you know, all the members of the planning team and the steering committee, Dave Halsing, Dick Luthi, Tom Mumley, Dave Smith, Luisa Valiela, and Jackie Zipkin really provided so much expertise and um, guidance in this process. Next slide. And then the, um, at the roundtable discussion, there were about 30 people there and um, from really different professional backgrounds. So it was a, um, a lot of different perspectives in the room to try to get the most kind of robust picture of a potential path forward while still keeping the conversation to a manageable size of people. Next slide. So one of the um, tasks of this workshop was to define some of the goals for nature-based solutions for shoreline resilience in the Bay Area. And um, these are written up in the report, which synthesizes the, the roundtable discussion. So um, nature-based solutions should serve communities, steward the environment, be cost-effective, be adaptable, be doable, and provide long-term value. And I'll go into each of these in a little more detail here. Next slide. So by serving communities, we mean a, a host of different things. The communities should be engaged in decision-making. There should be public shoreline access for recreation and traditional uses. Um, the nature-based solutions should protect infrastructure and homes from flooding. They should create local jobs. Um, they should publicly recognize the history and the original, original inhabitants of the area. They should have accessible outreach materials and they should serve to improve public health for local communities. Next slide. Um, by stewarding the natural environment, the report is referring to integrating shorelines into a larger watershed view, um, creating and protecting habitat, uh, particularly marshland or shoreline habitat in the face of climate change, providing habitat connectivity between different um, areas of the Bay estuary and improving the Bay's water quality. Next slide. We want our nature-based solutions at the shoreline to be cost-effective. So that means providing multiple benefits and also um, benefiting from cost sharing. Next slide. Nature-based solutions should also be adaptable. So for that to happen, there needs to be ongoing monitoring and an institutional ability to adapt to the results of monitoring. Um, so ideally these nature-based solutions would be designed and built as dyna dynamic systems that can be adaptable to changing conditions. Next slide. There was also um, a lot of talk at the workshop and having nature-based solutions be achievable. And one aspect of that was having right-sized shoreline projects. So, um, not so small that they didn't make um, much of a difference in terms of actual habitat provision or actual protection of vulnerable infrastructure, but not so big that they were um, extremely difficult to manage or even more difficult to coordinate all the different players. Um, and then another aspect of being achievable is that there may there is a need to develop governance structures for leadership, permitting, and long-term oversight. And um, the design permitting and long-term maintenance must also be achievable. And, and Ian will get into talking more about some of the challenges and solutions in these areas. Next slide. Um, Nature-based solutions at the shoreline should also provide long-term value. So um, there's a need for us to develop metrics to assess, assess, assess their success, <laughs> to be able to judge how well they're doing over time and from the get-go, we should be planning for long-term maintenance and governance. Next slide. So I, I do want to be clear that in this roundtable discussion, there were very diverse viewpoints about the goals. There wasn't a clear consensus that all of these goals should be included in every project. Um, and there's, it became evident that we really need systems for equitably balancing the varied goals for nature-based solutions for any given project with acknowledging that priorities could vary in different geographic locations and in different communities. Next slide. Okay, and I will pass it over to Ian to talk about um, some of the challenges and solutions. Good morning, uh, my name is Ian Ren and thank you for joining us. So I'm going to talk about some of the challenges to implementing nature-based solutions as identified in the workshop. 
and some of the solutions that the group helped identify. So the participants of the workshop identified several main themes regarding primary challenges to implementing large-scale nature-based solutions or NBS in the region. So these include permitting pathways. A consistent theme of the workshop was that the current regulatory system features a one-size-fits-all approach and that some NBS practitioners were lamenting about how essentially private development and wetland restoration projects are, are treated to the same standard. And a key question is how can our regulatory agencies incentivize shoreline resiliency via nature-based solutions over hardened shorelines while also ensuring environmental protections. Second, elevating community and tribal voices and perspectives in the planning process. The traditional regulatory comment process and existing forms of community outreach are simply ineffective at soliciting input from underrepresented and disadvantaged communities. We suffer from creating unwelcome and inconvenient spaces to solicit feedback and more can be done to tap the unique expertise and perspectives from community-based organizations and socially vulnerable populations, some of, whom, some of whom maintain the closest connections to the Bay. So how can regulators and project proponents perform meaningful community engagement and increase community awareness regarding their vulner vulnerabilities and opportunities for involvement? Next is funding and partnerships. So grant funding is currently relatively abundant, but the process for tapping those funds is quite cumbersome and it's generally only sufficient to cover the costs of things like planning, design, and permitting. Implementation of a robust regional strategy will in all likelihood require tens of billions of dollars, which if you consider the flood and water quality impacts facing the region is probably a pretty good deal. So a key question was how to foster close partnerships among siloed agencies, encourage public private partnerships, and establish long-term and large-scale funding pools. And so finally, land use planning and governments, governance, which is sort of a catch-all for some of the really hard stuff. So how do we address the fact that land is astronomically expensive in the region, or that private landowners have little incentive to work regionally to protect property from flooding? And what about the fact that around 80 cities ring the bay and are under no obligation to work together. And even if they wanted to work together, that requires coordination and extra labor from already tapped staff members. Next slide. Okay. So a brief overview of the solutions, starting with permitting pathways. Workshop participants recognize that regulatory integration processes such as the Bay Regulatory Restoration Regulatory Integration Team or BRIT hold a lot of promise, but so far these processes don't explicitly incentivize nature-based solutions. And more often than not, it is still easier to pursue a gray versus a green infrastructure-based approach. Some of the regula regulators in the workshop challenged themselves to promote deeper integration among their agencies and articulate the regulatory flexibilities available to promote NBS, as well as the statutory limitations of their authority. These regulators also stress that early engagement is key and project proponents shouldn't be afraid to ask questions. The need to incentivize NBS over gray infrastructure and other traditional development types was stressed and ideas for articulating these contests, concepts through an arm of the BRIT known as the Policy Management Committee was brought up. This is a group of decision makers in the regulatory agencies that can conceivably shape policy and force greater levels of integration and transparency. Finally, the risk of inaction was discussed in terms of how we can project, project of how project proponents and regulators communicate that we don't really have time to act. And the longer that we wait, more wetlands will be lost and the most vulnerable communities will face insurmountable levels of flood risk. Key hurdles include the fact that to make the region more resilient, we need to fill portions of the bay. BCDC and the Water Board have adopted fill policies, but the federal agencies are what really matters. And in order to permit wetland fill or the conversion of poor quality wetlands to ecotone slopes, for instance, we need to fully capture the benefits and consequences of not doing a resiliency project. Next slide. 
So elevating community and tribal voices and perspectives. So engaging community and tribal met, met partners early and throughout the project development process is a critical component of equitable shoreline resilience. The voices of underrepresented gr groups are not typically heard in traditional community outreach processes, and those who do engage are oversubscribed and tend to burn out eventually. As a region, we need to invest in community-based organizations to enable their particip participation and to recognize their value in ensuring regional resilience. BCDC has been leading in this regard lately through the formation of an environmental justice and community engagement staff role, creation of a racial equity action plan and team, and soliciting funding for environmental justice advisors to promote appropriate community engagement, assess disproportionate impacts of projects under BCDC's jurisdiction, and to increase community awareness of shoreline adaptation planning process. This is a, huge, a helpful model that will hopefully benefit all regulatory agencies and pro project proponents in the region. Other concepts stressed at the workshop include the need to meet people where they are and to provide convenient meet meeting locations, times, and multilingual forms of communication. Next slide. Funding and partnerships. As I'll touch on in the next slide, we are currently entering a time of abundance in terms of local, regional, state, and federal funding. But even with this significant state and federal grants, we cannot implement projects of the scale or within the timeline needed to protect the region. Much of the funding must come from local sources. And the passage of Measure AA demonstrated the region is prepared to fund shoreline resilience, but additional sources are needed to equitably pay for the necessary investments. Some agencies such as wastewater agencies have more reliable funding sources compared to say funding flood districts or stormwater agencies, or even private developers. We need to figure out how to invest in nature-based flood control via various financing innovations with a demonstrated capacity to work. An existing or new entity could provide capacity support to facilitate funding and collaboration or cultivate new partnerships for funding and innovation. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we are, either in or entering a, a, a period of abundance. Uh, this article in the New York Times was just from a couple of days ago, highlighting how the two recent federal bills, uh, the infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, allocate several billion dollars specifically for coastal resilience. Um, the last two years of the state budgets have uh, allocated several hundred million dollars for coastal resilience and nature-based solutions. And there's other, sources of funding. Also, uh, there was a one-time increase in the EPA's Water Quality Improvement Fund this year, and then we have Measure AA and additional programs at the state and federal level that do um, provide a lot of opportunity for, sure for the region to tap. Um, so, but getting this money is, is difficult and uh, as, as I said, this isn't enough money to really move the needle in the long term. Next slide. So this is the big last big picture challenge and it can be summarized by the need to promote deep partnerships and change agents within agencies and communities. This is related to elevating community voices but extends to establishing trust and open communication among private and public entities that are not generally used to working together or pooling resources. When you look at the literature surrounding challenges to promoting multi-benefit projects in general, governance is a key issue, more so than funding or permitting. Without internal and external champions, big projects just don't get built and partners need to know that transparent cost sharing agreements and maintenance agreements are in place to ensure project sustainability. Themes brought up at the workshop include the the creation of incentives for nature-based solutions on private lands, regulatory incentives to promote deeper cooperation, and the establishment of funding and funding of a new or existing body to advance deep partnerships. Our region has a deep well of planning processes and agencies such as SFEP, the Bay Joint Venture, Bay Adapt, Baycan, Q 
Can we better integrate or build upon these efforts to play a more active role in project facilitation? These entities or some other form of central coordinating body can serve as an external champion and help empower individuals and facilitate co collaborations among natural and not so natural allies in the region. Thank you. And I'll now ha hand it off to Liz Jubera to wrap up the presentation. Thanks so much, Ian, for walking us through those critical solution areas um, and giving us a good detailed account of the report. Uh, the next step that we're going to cover is the establishment of key near-term milestones or potential markers of progress that can help us to meet the goals of NBS that Sasha stated earlier and also directly lend to the success of the projects down the line that Ian was describing. Um, first, the report calls out a need to really build and cultivate partnerships. This means investing heavily in a regional NBS community of practice including stakeholders from diverse agencies, organizations, and communities. This could also include creating paid training opportunities for new decision makers, as well as establishing professional networks across regional partners, uh, and empowering those same folks to facilitate equitable collaboration, fundraising, and capacity building within their realms. Next, metrics should be developed that reflect the full range of stakeholder goals. These metrics should include performance, monitoring, and adaptive management, and should also address social goals. For example, shoreline access for recreation or traditional uses. Next, a strategic plan should be developed to scale shoreline resilience projects to align with operational landscape units, or OLUs, that were developed by the San Francisco Estuary Institute and spur in the Adaptation Atlas. To do this, we should prioritize projects that are important at a larger strategic level and identify and coordinate OLU-specific partners, champions, and funding for coordination and collaboration on those projects. A few more milestones that emerged from the workshop, including that it is critically important to evaluate permitting pathways, as Ian already iterated. In doing so, regulatory processes and flexibilities should become transparent to NBS project proponents, and a regulatory forum should be established for resolving challenges that are posed by the implementation of NBS. Some of those include performance standards, habitat mitigation, or monitoring expectations. And once again, it cannot be overstated how much practitioners need to invest regionally in community and tribal engagement. It's necessary to develop meaningful relationships with communities long before specific project planning comes into play. And this means developing a sustainable funding mechanism to support partnerships across community-based organizations, tribes, environmental planners, regulators, project designers, and more. Programs that support community-led planning and eco-literacy should also be expanded through the development of multilingual outreach materials, technical expertise, and public engagement events. And lastly, we need to build on and promote prior successes. Materials on NBS planning and design should be widely distributed to help translate local successes into regional guidelines. And best practices for collaborative governance should be identified including potential expansions to the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority project set to allow for wastewater and stormwater projects and to the BRIT, as Ian mentioned, the Bay Restoration Regulatory Integration Team to encompass NBS measures. That said, nature-based solutions are still very much gaining traction here in the Bay Area and internationally. And there's a lot of opportunity for research in this area to help reduce uncertainty about their performance and the integration of them into ecological solutions for our region. Workshop participants identified several areas of research that fell under two main categories. Those that facilitate the optimization of NBS for specific ecological outcomes, and those that inform policies for sediment allocation. Under the first category, valuable research could include the characterization of habitat benefits, seepage slope, material composition, pollutant removal efficiencies, and more based on variable NBS designs, could also include the development of metrics and methods for quantifying the benefits of NBS versus conventional infrastructure on qualities like wave attenuation, carbon sequestration, and recreational value. 
We could also have an investigation into the ways of ensuring its accessibility of resources to all partners and stakeholders, including determining opportunities to implement suggestions in accompanying agency plans such as Bay Adapt. Under the second category, research may look a little like development of technical guidance on NBS soil and fill quality, as well as regulatory guidelines for sediment allocation. An analysis of impacts from using upland sources or biosolids for shoreline resilience. And from this workshop and the collaboration of our partners and stakeholders, it is very clear that nature-based solutions for shoreline resilience will not be implemented without concerted persistent effort. And there are a few key takeaways that emerged from this process. The first is that to achieve any of the next steps identified in this report, we must work together not only as a region, but also work at a regional scale taking a regional approach to building partnerships, defining performance criteria, evaluating permitting processes, and investing in engagement with community and tribal organizations has the potential to maximize ecological and social benefits while maintaining project benefit, cost effectiveness, and efficiency. Next, public engagement efforts are really needed to advance priorities at all scales. So broader and more equitable inclusion in convenings around NBS, as well as resource development for public outreach around the topic are key to creating community-led, collaboratively designed projects. And while the planning team here made an effort to really broaden participation to include a range of stakeholder groups in the, web, uh, in the, the workshop, that workshop would have really benefited and the resulting report also would have benefited from a greater representation of community-based and tribal groups. Lastly, NBS advancement is very much an adaptive process. There is no one size fits all approach to designing, planning, or implementing NBS. These varied infrastructural assets, such as horizontal levees, floating wetlands, oyster reefs, et cetera, are place-based, nuanced, and they all have tangible impacts on stakeholders. And their planning and implementation should really be guided by the goals set forward in this report. And while it may be a slower process than using traditional gray infrastructure, NBS can offer a path to greater resiliency and more equitable development down the line. I'd like to quickly go ahead and thank the many sponsors of the Bay Area One Water Network and the San Francisco Estuary Partnership that make this work possible. And I would also like to thank all of you so much for your time and for joining us today. We really appreciate your interest in this report and all of the work that may emerge as a result of this effort. And I would now like to introduce Heidi Nutter's project management with project manager at the San Francisco Estuary Partnership and manager of the Transforming Urban Waters Initiative, who is going to lead the Q&A section of our webinar. And I see that we already have a few questions loaded up, Heidi. Great, thank you, Liz and Ian and, and Sasha for walking us through the report. And I just wanna emphasize that, you know, this report is a reflection of the, the findings that came out of this robust discussion. Um, and as Sasha said, there were about 30 participants. We have a lot more people here on the webinar. So this is a great opportunity to hear from you all, um, what your takeaways are from the report, how you're thinking about it in terms of the work that you're doing. Um, so before we launch into questions, and as Liz said, we have a few, um, we have a poll that we'd like to um, launch just to get a sense of who's in the virtual room. Um, I think that Diana just launched that. Um, so if you could just take a couple of minutes to fill this out as we um, review the initial questions, um, just to give us a sense of you know, what, um, what areas you all work in, um, and then you can either add your questions into the Q&A or you can raise your hand, which I see that Jen has her hand raised and we will um, get to your questions. So just um, getting into the responses here, it seems like a good mix of um, local, state and federal government um, and um, consulting, maybe your private business. Um, many of you are currently working on an NBS project, which is great. And we'd love to hear how that's going. 
um, and that we're in a pretty well distributed in terms of different phases of the process itself, um, and that most of you are from the Bay Area. Um, so with that, I think I will start with um, the questions that, or maybe I'll actually I'll start with um, Jen who has her hand raised. Do you wanna ask a question, Jen? I think I need to make it so you can talk. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I also, I don't think, I don't know if my screen is showing me, so, um, so people can see my face, but I have a couple of comments and I super appreciate all the work um, that I can you hear me now I can hear you and we can see you too. Okay. All right. There was a little fun glitch. Um, okay. Just a couple of things. What I was saying was super proud of this effort. This is so happy to be um, supporting it and, and having the discussions critical as we all know, a um, couple statements. Number one, um, many of the, I am going to be speaking, I am with EPA Region 9. I am the lead for the sediment management team in our region. I also work on wetland restoration efforts, including, um, you know, regulatory guidance and policy initiatives. So from that perspective, I want to say that um, I think it's important for the funding, for the public-private partnerships that we are building there is a clear need to message, at least to the federal agencies, um, and you know, such as FEMA, that uh, nature-based solutions are a clear winner for climate resiliency, climate justice resiliency. We, we need to make that. We need to make that right off the bat. We, that's our hook, and we need to get a clear, uh, succinct, um, shared message on that. Number one. Number two. Um, there, you know, there's so many other efforts outside the region, um, many of which we are all working on. Um, BCDC and several of other of us recently attended a workshop with the um, American Shore and Beach Preservation Association, the Coastal States Organization, and the Corps of Engineers regarding, this was specific to sediment, re beneficially reusing sediment, but it also, you know, that is one of the tools that we use for nature base. Um, work and we need to get we need our efforts need to be reflected in any reporting that they are doing as well so i intend to make sure that this effort is tied in with their effort like they're seeing the results so that they can reflect that up to the national level as well thirdly um <laughs> i don't wonder if i remember all my points here ah regulatory guidance and um you know, to specifically help with our regional goals here in, in this project. Um, we, we, the collective agencies, including EPA and um, the Corps of Engineers, Water Board, BCDC, participated in a in-depth effort for wetland type conversion. We have a framework that's out there. It is a framework that will help us to ascertain the risk of inaction and the, and the benefits of nature-based solutions. So I wanna make a plug for that because it's out there in the world, um, ready for usage uh, by regulatory agencies as well as planners. I think that was everything. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. And we really appreciate it. EPA Region 9 is one of the funders of this effort. Um, so thank you for adding your comments. And um, I will make sure to include the wetland type conversion um, link in on in the chat once I get a chance, but if you can get to it faster than me, that's great. Um, so I'm going to get to um, one of the questions in um, the Q&A that I think is, um, you know, could be a good discussion and um, Liz and Ian and Sasha feel free to weigh in. So the question is, um, many funding agencies are less familiar with NBS approaches and have traditionally favored gray infrastructure approaches. 
what needs to be done to educate the State Water Board, FEMA, OES, um, Coastal Conservancy, and other funders about NBS and how it can address the goals of these funding programs. Do funding agencies need to change their rules procedures to more fairly entertain MB NBS proposals? I would say as somebody who is working to advance NBS and applies for a lot of funding to do that, um, many of these agencies have embraced nature-based solutions and um, are really supportive of the development of these types of projects. Um, one thing that Ian mentioned when he was going through the, the funding section is just more the challenges about the fact that the, the size and scope of those funding programs might be might lead to a project implementer needing to create a pretty complex patchwork of funding in order to actually implement a project. So you can get a small pot of funding here for community engagement, a pot of funding here for initial design or you know technical studies needed for permitting, um, but that um, it is it is a much more complex process to bring all of that funding in to get a project from development to community engagement all the way through to construction. And for many local implementing entities, the path for that gray infrastructure approach is kind of already laid out. Um, you know, the, the types of funding sources that those governments would go to are already known and wouldn't require as much of a you know, staff level management of those funds. So I think the barrier is more just about how those funds work together and um, that it's just a much more complex process in order to actually fund the projects. There's plenty of money out for there for NBS though. So that is one positive note. And I think most of the funding sources that Ian referenced um, do support nature-based solutions in some capacity. Um, Ian or others, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I guess the fact that that funding agencies are explicitly calling out nature-based solutions, you know, in state and federal programs, as well as, you know, Measure AA regionally just is an indicator of the progress that's been made over the last five to 10 years. And um, you know, hearing from EPA, you know, there's, there, there's a clear recognition within federal agencies, um, EPA and Army Corps, that nature-based solutions are play are going to play a vital role, and I, and that seems to be trickling down into the the grant making uh, processes. So it seems promising, um, but you know, the the question remains whether they'll get the amount of funding that sort of traditional gray infrastructure tends to receive. And as it was noted, you know, that two point, you know, several billion dollars for nature-based solutions sounds like a lot, but compared to, you know, the many billions of dollars that were um, allocated through those bills, it's it's not very much. So I think we there's still room to be room to grow and opportunity to better articulate and quantify the benefits of these projects that can be on par or exceed the benefits associated with traditional gray infrastructure. Thank you, Ian. Um, so I'm gonna go to another question here um, from I think Joanna um, Guerin, um, who says, um, thank you for the presentation. I heard you said there are many governance challenges to implementing MBS, but you didn't, you know, basically asking to dive into those a little bit more. And I think that's a good question because, and there was quite a bit of discussion about this at the round table. So I wanna highlight some of the, um, some of the findings that, that came out of that, um, that I noticed. And one of them, and actually I just saw Jackie Zipkin pop up and it, it, um, this might be a good segue for you to maybe add your thoughts as well. But I was going to mention the East Bay Discharges Authority first mile project as an example. So um, I think with local projects, you know, we're, we're deal we, we need to put them into their plan the planning context, whether there's a local master plan or zoning or you know um, conservation plan that is the overlay for that particular project. And also the, the land ownership issues, um, which can be very complex on um, 
you know, on the local level. So you might have an implementing entity, but the land itself has multiple landowners or there's infrastructure, um, you know, on the, the wetland that where the project is being developed. And so just some of those local issues that are related to, you know, the planning context, the, the land ownership context, um, the zoning um, you know, could, um, has been an issue with some of these projects. Um, those are things that definitely need to be addressed. And I'll just put a plug for the Transforming Shorelines Collaborative, which is a meeting that we host um, about twice a year where we dive into some of these topics. Um, I put um, a link to the collaborative where you can sign up to be on that list in the one of the answers. And in our next collaborative, we'll be focusing on that project and actually having a dive into governance um, and like sort of local planning context as um, being addressing one of the that topic as one of the challenges to this project. But Jackie, do you want to add anything? That was great, Heidi. Um, so I'm Jackie Zipkin. I'm the general manager of the East Bay Dischargers Authority and the project manager for the first mile project that Heidi was describing. And um, I would just add, you know, what one of the opportunities with nature based solutions is that they're multi-benefit projects by definition. They provide flood protection, they provide habitat, they provide water quality improvement, yet the way our society is currently structured, different government agencies are often responsible for providing those different benefits to the community. And so in order to realize a vision of having a project that really provides these multiple benefits, those different government agencies have to partner together. So you need flood control at the table, um, perhaps the wastewater agencies for the water quality piece, uh, there are, you know, habitat uh, focused organizations, groups, recreation. Um, so, you know, parks departments, um, the Bay Trail, uh, the and then the landowner where you want to site this, uh, this uh, nature based solution might be yet another um, entity. So um, by definition, these projects have benefits and uh, impacts on a multitude of, of stakeholders. And so that's where the governance gets complicated. And I think we have some great examples and tools to work with, but these projects just take a little bit more organization than a traditional gray infrastructure project that one agency can just build. Yeah, thank you so much, Jackie. Um, so there was a question here that was kind of more of a suggestion. So I, I, I made it live so that you could all see it, hopefully, um, related to eco concrete, um, which is a bioavailable concrete for shoreline infrastructure. So great to know. And thank you for sharing that link. Um, I am going to go to another question here. Um, what regional efforts can we align with for NBS or that are coming? Um, how is the exploration of NBS interfacing with existing restoration efforts? And then for the adaptation OLU recommendations, how do public agencies learn about further exploring these options, such as oyster reefs? Um, I Let me just make sure you all can see that question. I don't know, Ian, if you want to touch on a response there. I think that there are several regional um, efforts that are ongoing, and those are referenced in the report. I think in the early section of the report, there's a listing of regional efforts, and we worked really hard to make sure that we were not reinventing the wheel or duplicating efforts, that this is really a set of findings out of, you know, this convening, but I think they're largely consistent with that regional guidance. And we did look at Bay Adapt, for example, um, and, you know, made sure that some of our recommendations were consistent there. Um, so I would definitely highlight those regional documents, which had a much more extensive um, engagement effort um, as as kind of the guiding lights for the for re, for advancing NBS at the regional level, um, and I would also add the SFEP's estuary blueprint, which was just released and has a number of actions for nature-based solutions and climate adaptation more broadly. That um, is also a, a place that we're looking at least to advance those projects. Um, anybody want to add anything to that? 
Yeah, I would just say that, you know, there's, I think there's planning efforts at various scales and stages. Um, you know, maybe some of the higher level ones are like Bay Adapt um, that, you know, state the significance of nature-based solutions on a regional scale, um, that, but don't really get into the project specifics. Um, and then there's um, site-specific initiatives, such as the kinds that Heidi have and Liz are working on, such as Palo Alto, uh, wastewater agency. And then there's other regional initiatives, um, such as a, a project funded by the wastewater agencies, uh, which is represented by the Bay Area Clean Water Agencies, or BACWA, to explore the use of nature-based solutions for nutrient management. Um, so I, I think they're, you know, I'm happy to feel free to reach out directly to any of us, and I'm sure we could help direct you if if it would help, um, you know, foster any kind of partnerships. Uh, I'm looking at the last effort. So for Adaptation Atlas OLU recommendations, how do public agencies learn about furthering exploring those options, which is part of that question. Um, you know, so the Adaptation Atlas is a is a document prepared by SFEI, and it's currently being um, updated and refined and expanded uh, to develop sort of sub sub regional adaptation strategies with a special focus on nature based solutions. Um, so that's a good good resource for folks um, and. You know, in terms of exploring these options further, you know, I mean, re reaching out to any of us or SFPI would be a good start. Thank you. So your response on that was a good segue to this other question that says, are there any new or upcoming NBS projects about, um, beyond the big kind of well-known ones, self-based salt ponds or, or Loma, even in the planning stage? And I'm so glad you asked that question because there are a lot of projects in development right now. And I would say that, you know, Oraloma was really this incredible jumping off point for the region in terms of nature-based solutions and horizontal levees in particular, which um, was a little bit of the focus of the round table, although I think that we it, it was was a little bit broader than that. Um, but I would say that, you know, following the success of, of the Oraloma horizontal levee and um, I'll just mention that on our website, which I'll put in the chat, we have a listing of all of the pub, you know, peer reviewed articles that came out of that project that really demonstrate some of the water quality and benefits, um, improvement benefits of, of the horizontal levee in particular, that have just been so exciting to see. Um, there have been a number of projects that have been developed. Um, I think the interesting thing about nature-based solutions is that they're not one size fits all, which really did come out in the report. And that each of the communities that are developing this are working with a different set of benefits. So they don't all look like Oraloma. And in fact, I don't think any of them look quite like Oraloma or will look like that. So some projects that are currently in development um, is First of all, the Palo Alto Horizontal Levee, which is directly adjacent to the Palo Alto um, wastewater treatment plant on Embarcadero Road. Um, that project is actually um, uh, working, the project team, some of whom I think are on the call, are going to be applying for permits in the next couple of weeks for that project. Um, and construction is planned for 2024. Um, we are working on raising funds for construction. Um, there's been a great community engagement component of that project. And um, it's also a habitat focused NBS project with wastewater polishing being um, sort of an additional benefit as well. Um, there's also a project in North Richmond, the North Richmond horizontal levy that Liz um, has recently taken on management of that is more focused on a community engagement model um, for development of, of a project like that. So it's really taking this approach that is very stakeholder driven and working with all of the entities on the shoreline, 
where some of those governance issues are, are have, there's some really interesting questions there, working with all of those partners together to develop a, an approach and a process um, in partnership with the designer. And that work is funded by the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority. And I should mention that the other project from Palo Alto is funded by the Coastal Conservancy um, and EPA and also the city of Palo Alto. Um, would, there's several others, um, the list goes on, but maybe um, would anybody else like to, and I mentioned the First Mile project as well, um, would anybody else like to mention other NBS projects happening? I mean, I think this kind of goes into like, how do we define NBS? And, you know, there's, there's been kind of a focus on the wastewater sector. And I think a lot of the plants in our region do have a very long history of being pretty innovative in this space. For instance, the Mountain View Sanitary Sanitation District in um, Sassoon Bay area was one of the first treatment wetlands on the West Coast in the 70s. Um, and then there was, you know, Petaluma has a relatively recent uh, treatment wetland. Um, all the far North Bay wastewater agencies have been, uh, basically do not discharge wastewater in the dry season and you know allocated either either to wetlands or to irrigated agriculture namely vineyards uh, which is a great way to avoid the effects of uh, nutrient enrichment in the bay um, and you know there's other approaches to flood control that might involve uh, wetland restoration projects you know the south bay salt ponds project was you know one of the largest restoration projects on the West Coast. And it's, uh, you know, ostensibly for habitat purposes, but it also is achieving a lot of indirect benefits, such as habitat and flood control. Uh, Jennifer? Yeah. Yep. Jen? Thanks, Ian. Ian, that's an amazing point. Um, that's kind of where I was going to go to. There's a lot of different sectors that need nature based solutions and really pointing out and being clear about those opportunities around the Bay at both the large scale, sexy scale and a more, you know, pedestrian small scale. For instance, such the, the West Bay San, uh, Sanitary District currently has a public notice out for your review and commenting if you wish. They're gonna be putting in um, fill to put in an ecotone to handle some of their uh, um, waste, wastewater or, or outflow areas. They're also doing, uh, I believe, a living shoreline with oysters. So there, yeah, I, this the, the districts, the airports, let's not forget the airports, um, basically anything and everything <laughs> that is critical to sustain our communities um, is, is going to need some sort of nature-based solution, Highway 37, um, so I think it's really critical to note, um, and this is part of that messaging that we were talking about, not just to, you know, to the choir, all of us, but up to the politicals that, you know, um, really every, uh, everything that we depend upon, including connections to the Bay and the wildlife and their habitat is going to be, needs to, is in fact doing some sort of nature-based solution, um, creative solution. Yeah, thank you, Jen. And I, I want to highlight the the comment you made that in the Q and A about um, that from a technical standpoint, the Brit Forum has been conducting technical trainings from staff, and that it might be good to have an ongoing training opportunity as the region generates this critical technical information. Um, and that's absolutely, um, I think, the approach that we support, and that really came up consistently in the round table, which is the need um, for, you know, these types of projects are, are new. They are a little bit of an unknown. It's a, frankly, it's a risk for local governments to take on a, a, a new approach, you know? Um, and so the, the more that we can support that effort through regional capacity building, coordination, working together, the more cover it gives those local governments when they're making that decision to, you know, hey, we're gonna try 
this um, a new approach. We're going to try nature-based solutions. And I want to highlight the question about um, community-based organizations because I think CBOs can play a really cru crucial role there. Community members can be some of the biggest champions for nature-based solutions in their own backyards. And so CBOs are a really very important link in, in helping um, to you know, be a you know, champion these projects and, and make them happen. Um, let's see, we have probably more questions than we have time for. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll go to this question. Um, when developing future connections with tribes and tribal communities, how do you see these um, partnerships developing in um, with nature-based solutions, long-term or short-term? And that's from Alex Tavazon. Thank you, Alex. Um, I know there's many people on this panel and also um, that are attending that are doing all kinds of tribal engagement. Um, at the Estuary Partnership, we're definitely interested in developing um, best practices for engaging with tribes on nature-based solutions. I think that at every stage of the development process from early conception of a project through design development, um, through construction, there are opportunities to engage tribes. One thing that we've looked at for some of our projects is the plant palette itself for these types of projects. How can we have a planting palette that's achieving intended results for habitat that's also providing cultural um, uses for tribal communities? And, and is there a way that we can design these types of projects that includes planting for those, uh, for, you know, plants of high cultural use value in locations that are accessible to tribes within um, a project area while protecting sensitive habitat. Um, we've also been really interested in, um, you know, just general outreach to tribes on these types of projects, you know, um, making sure that projects, in, um, you know, as they're built, have land acknowledgements that acknowledge the original peoples of the land, um, or even, you know, art that's collaborating with the local tribes, um, you know, or some kind of gathering space or other opportunities that, you know, the tribe might identify as a benefit to their communities. Um, so I see that as being an area that needs more work, mostly because we haven't had the opportunity to build many of these projects. But as we see more get closer to construction, I think we'll be able to experiment more with what it looks like on the ground, hopefully with more partnership um, with tribes. Um, let's see. Um, I see Javier shared a link, um, Fernandez from the water board shared a link. So I'm just gonna make sure that everybody can see that um, to the Alameda County Climate Action Plan that I, I think was referenced. Um, I might just end it there rather than trying to go over unless um, anybody has any final comments. I think, is there one hand raised? Joya Fishman, do you wanna ask a question or make a comment? Yeah, um, hi, I'm Joya Fishman. I did some uh, research at the Oraloma Horizontal Levy on the planting palette. And so I just wanted to make a comment in relation to uh, involvement of tribal communities is that what I got from some of the project partners was that they wanted sort of a hands-off approach on the management of the plants, but there was a lot of decreased diversity after about six years. So I think that working with tribal communities on indigenous management to promote like desired diversity as well as like plants that are culturally important would be also another part of the process that I think could involve them. Um, Cause I think it would have really benefited from some more management during that time. Thank you for that comment. Um, great, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Sasha to um, as our host um, who started us off to close out the webinar. Um, thank you all very much for this robust discussion. There was more questions than we could answer. And I appreciate all of the interest and engagement on this. Um, 
definitely continue to stay engaged. Uh, the collab, the Transforming Shorelines Collaborative is a great forum for this kind of ongoing discussion. So if you found this interesting, I would highly encourage you to sign up um, for that email list. Um, we don't meet that often, so we won't spam your inbox. Um, but thank you all. Yeah, just to echo that, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And um, feel free to share the report with your friends and colleagues. And um, let us know if you have any other feedback by email. We're happy to engage outside of this webinar, too. So have a good rest of your day. And thank you again for coming. Thank you.